Welcome to the Present History Podcast. We have a very special episode today as we are with Joanna Grahovich, a polar historian and critically acclaimed author. Uh, Joanna, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. No, it's fantastic. So would you mind telling us a, a little bit about yourself, uh, your background? What made you get into into history? Uh, my name is Joanna Grohovich. I um, I write about uh, uh, the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Um, I'm based in New Zealand, but I spend a lot of time in the UK, uh, generally to access the archival collections there yeah. because they're just so phenomenal. Um, we've got some really great resources here in New Zealand, um, Canterbury University and the, the libraries down in Wellington, but um, really the, the gold is in the United Kingdom and particularly in uh, at the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. It's a wonderful repository of, um, of treasure. It's a real treasure trove really. So I spend a lot of time in the UK. Um, at the moment, I'm researching a book about the Arctic. So it's a bit of a departure for me. My my previous books have all focused on Antarctica, uh, an area close to my heart and also close to New Zealand. Uh, I think a lot of New Zealanders feel uh, a real attachment to the Antarctic continent simply because mm. it's uh, geographically quite close to us, but also given our country's uh, the role that we've played in provisioning many of those uh, historic expeditions and also this, the uh, uh, close relationships with some of the the key personalities in, in uh, that early uh, heroic age, you know, Captain Scott uh, and his crew, as well as Shackleton. So uh, the Arctic story is... Uh, that I'm researching at the moment that is the story of uh, the, the the search for the Northwest Passage and in particular the role that Jane Lady Franklin played in not only uh, the uh, uh, as the wife of Sir John Franklin but also in her many searches for her husband once he went missing so that was wow. um, that's, that's what I'm interested in at the moment so I'm I'm migrating northward. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There are, one of the things that you discover with um, with the the expeditions is just the the wealth of material. They've mm. been really well documented. Not only uh, the official narratives that were always a, a part of the expedition when they returned, the uh, the the expedition leaders would. Uh, publish a, uh, a a narrative and that would go out into the public arena but there is also a wealth of material in, in terms of the, the personal diaries the letters and that's where a lot of the real gold is in terms of yeah. uh, building up a, a more novelistic approach to telling the story so that's that's um you know that's that's a a real uh, consideration for me uh, being able to access those those historically uh, accurate details that, that really bring the story alive. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating, and I think that in particular polar history is is an area that not many people look at too much. But like you say, there are some some incredible stories of of these explorers and their adventures that a lot of them end up kind of going a bit wrong. But that yeah. makes for, which, for fantastic which stories. Is, which, which is ter terrific from from my point of view. You know, you don't <laughs> really want to tell an, an you don't want to tell a, a happy story. You want to tell a, a story where people are pitted against nature and and uh, terrible things happened. They overcome adversity. They have to uh, dig deep and and find courage and um, and. <laughs> you know the 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 physical bravery but also the the mental hardiness to to confront yeah. uh some of these really you know inc incredible challenges absolutely absolutely and your your latest book that is published um is Shackleton's Endurance an Antarctic survival story um follows the incredible story of Ernest Shackleton and his journey to Antarctica would you mind giving us a, a brief outline of his story and his exploration? Sure. It's uh, it's certainly one of the better known 
stories of the uh, his heroic age. Shackleton in 1914 embarked on a, a very orda an audacious attempt to, that's me. sorry, I need to turn my phone down. Um, at that point, the Pole had already been conquered. The South Pole had already been conquered by uh, Roald Amundsen. Shackleton was desperate to make his mark uh, in, in polar history, and he wanted to make the first ever crossing of the continent. So he mounted the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition and leaving Great Britain on the eve of war, just wow. as mobilization was declared in, in Britain. And there was some uh, concern around that. You know, he was he was taking a whole lot of young men away from uh, a war. Yeah. And uh, he was he was told that he could proceed. So he went he went south. They stopped uh, in at South Georgia briefly, carried on to the Weddell Sea. The boat was beset. Uh, in January of 1915, and the men realised pretty soon uh, that they weren't going to be able to get the boat free. Um, they weren't going to be able to actually make landfall, and they weren't going to be able to embark on this uh, plan to cross Antarctica. Wow. A journey that was that was going to um, be very challenging. It was a distance of 1,800 miles to, to make that crossing. Instead, they turned the ship into winter quarters and the ship then was carried by the sea ice. They were there for nine months until the oh, wow. pressure that built up around the boat um, meant that they had to abandon ship that was taking on water. It was very clear that that ship was not going to be able to get them home safely. So they abandoned the ship. They set up a camp on the on the ice flows on the Weddell Sea, and they remained there for six months. Wow! Unfortunately, nobody knew where they were. Uh, so, and there was a war going on. So they knew that there would be no rescue, and if they wanted to survive, they had to come up with a plan to uh, to save themselves to get back somehow. Luckily, they had three lifeboats, and they were able to use those um, once they had drifted far enough north. Uh, to the edge of um, the sea ice where it starts to break up, they were able to launch those boats. Uh, very, very rudimentary uh, conditions. Uh, they were able to um, get to Elephant Island. Uh, it took them six days in these open boats. They got to Elephant Island. Um, and then... The story doesn't end there uh, <laughs> because they weren't going to be saved there. As, uh, they weren't going to be able to be rescued there either. Nobody knew that they were there. The island was uninhabited. It wasn't visited by, by the sealing fleet. So, uh, again, Shackleton had to hop in one of those small lifeboats, the James Caird, and make the perilous journey, one of the, the greatest uh, journeys in maritime history, I, I, I believe, to South Georgia. And this was uh, 800, 800 miles in an open wow. boat to South Georgia, across the, the most treacherous stretch of ocean on the planet. And he did that with um, five, other, five other men. And the story doesn't end there because once they managed to get to South Georgia, they landed on the other side of, uh, so the uninhabited side of South, South Georgia. And Shackleton, along with Frank Worsley, and Tom Crean made the first ever crossing of South Georgia, a very sort of uh, treacherous, mountainous, crevasse wow. riddled area. And um, they made that crossing in just over, you know, 36 hours. Wow. Managed to manage to get, um, raise the alarm at the, at the sealing station, uh, whaling station. And, uh, and then they had to somehow organize a ship to, to get back to the men on Elephant Island. And that, that was in itself a very tricky business. It took them four attempts. On the final attempt, they actually managed to get close enough to Elephant Island. But by this stage, it was winter. There was a lot of ice built up around in that area. So that was the access was, was, a, was a huge consideration. But anyway, they, they managed to get the men, save um, 
uh, saved the 22 men that were left on Elephant Island. Not one man was lost. Wow. And um, unfortunately, the story doesn't end there, though. <laughs> um, this is something that, that a lot of people forget. There was a team of men that had been sent to the other side of Antarctica. They were known as the Ross Sea Party. And those men were responsible for setting up some supply depots halfway um, well, to the to the base of the Beardmore Glacier, so that when theoretically Shackleton appeared over the horizon with with the um, the five other men that were going to make this crossing, they would have some supplies. Um, the Ross Sea Party obviously didn't know anything about the, the the ship being lost, the fact that the expedition didn't take place, but they still made the supply. They still set out those supplies, and they had had. A dreadful time. Um, they'd lost their ship, and um, they they were finally uh, rescued. Uh, three men of uh, in that contingent had died. One of wow. them on scurvy, and then two of the others had been um, lost on the sea ice. They'd they'd float either floated out to sea or or gone through the ice. Um, so unfortunately, when people say that not one man was lost, they don't generally count that uh, that other contingent in the Ross Sea. So that's a, um, a, a very short, uh, rather rushed rendition of what happened on, on endurance. And that's, um, it's an incredible story. It's really five stories, five adventure stories wrapped up in one. Yeah, no, that is, it's an incredible story. It's an incredible yeah. story. You need everyone to know this story because it is such an incredible story. Um, what was it that kind of drew you to this story to to write about it? Well, to to be honest, I didn't want to write the story about Shackleton. I felt that uh, there were enough books about Shackleton already. He seems to be the one that has captured people's imagination, certainly in recent times with a whole lot of interest around his leadership style. So yeah. that's brought a whole lot of people and you know people who didn't necessarily know the story um into the fold and um i after having written about captain scott and about amundsen uh, many of the readers that contacted me said oh when are you going to do shackleton so i was a bit reluctant to do to do that and um i was trying to think of some way to bring a, you know a bit of a fresh spin to the story and while I was at uh, Scott Polar in Cambridge I saw in their friends room which is where you have morning tea there's uh, the spa from the endurance above set above the door wow. and this is the only relic of endurance that's left obviously they've discovered endurance now in the Weddell Sea yeah. we had all those incredible images but we don't have any any parts of the ship uh, and this spa was was used as ballast in one of the small lifeboats that I said they had, um, yeah. you know, escaped the sea ice in. And then it was on Elephant Island, it had been used as a flagpole. And then James Wordy, the expedition chief scientist, had brought that back and had given it to Spry um, wow. as a, you know, as a sort of a totem. And I thought, well, you know, I hear a a lot I've heard a lot about Shackleton I know you know broadly the story but Shackleton didn't do this on his own mm -hmm. he was surrounded by 27 men who were these other men you know maybe we approach the story from their point of view and so I started to do a bit more research around the bit players and in, in the endurance story you know not necessarily thinking about Shackleton, you know, he, he wrote that wonderful, um, you know, the, the narrative South with a lot of wonderful details, but what were the experiences of some of the other men on the expedition? And many of the men were pretty simple types. They were um, uh, obviously the, the scientists. Um, there were a couple of doctors. There were just ordinary sailors. Um, there was the ship's carpenter, who was a real character, wow. uh, the quartermaster, a photographer. So there are a lot of people who were qualified to tell the story, and many yeah. of the men had kept quite detailed diaries. Captain Worsley, uh, the skipper, 
and Frank Hurley, the photographer, had both written their own accounts. So that was quite interesting to draw on those. But what was of more interest to me were the unpublished sources. So Harry McNish, for example, the, the expedition carpenter, who was a very uh, prickly Scotsman who, who was very opinionated. He, he was not, uh, I wouldn't say he was a popular member of the of the expedition in terms of his difficult personality, but he was certainly, um, he played an instrumental role in um, not only when the ship was 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 stuck, but also later um, when they were on the move with the ships. He was um, very close to uh, prompting a mutiny uh, when he refused to, um, to carry on. And there is some speculation about whether Shackleton would have had him shot. Wow. So there are all sorts of, of interesting elements that come into the story that aren't necessarily well known. Um, people who are interested in, in the story that, you know, that, that have done their own research, obviously these things are, you know, well known in, in those areas. But um, I felt that it, it brought um, some a, a bit of tension to, you know, the interpersonal relationships between the men. Not always easy. They were a very, uh, they were an odd mix of people. You know, you've got some very highly educated scientists from Cambridge mixing with, you know, some North Sea sailors who, you know, hadn't even finished high school. Wow. You know, so there's um that was really the the thing for me that that was of uh was going to be of greatest interest to tell the 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 other story the other stories of endurance and in this my Shackleton book um the the focus moves between the characters you know I use the word characters you know quite loosely because mm. of course these are real people and it's very important to me in my work that I um, adhere to that you know the historical accuracy I think the there's there's so much material that you know there's really no need to deviate from from the story or speculate it's all there you know the but it's it's what you pick out the the emphasis the 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 different um you know the the polyphony of of perspectives. I think that's uh, that's really key. Absolutely, no, it's it's fascinating. And uh, Shackleton's first real experience of the polar regions was as part of the crew of Captain Robert Falcon Scott's uh, expedition, who you have also yeah. written about in your first book, Into the White. Um, how much of an impact did Scott have on Shackleton? and then in Shackleton's own later expeditions. Mm. It's, a, it's a, such an interesting area of, of investigation, isn't it? I think a lot of people, it really appeals to a lot of people, this idea that there was real antipathy between the two of them, these two polar greats. And of course, you, as, you, as you rightly pointed out, Shackleton really got his start in Antarctica in the polar regions through Scott. He was a member of the Discovery Expedition and accompanied Scott and uh, Edward Wilson on the first ever attempt to reach the South Pole. They got to 82 degrees south and had a, had a really difficult time. They had, they'd taken uh, sledge dogs and without really knowing what they were doing, the dogs did not um, perform particularly well. And um, uh, the men ended up uh, having to haul the, the sledges their diet was insufficient. Um, they were all suffering um, from uh, scurvy, but Shackleton in particular was uh, particularly ba uh, uh, badly affected and ended up having to be hauled on the sledge by Scott and Wilson. Wow. When they got back to the, the, the ship, to Discovery, uh, there was... Uh, the ship was stuck. They were going to have to overwinter. They had a supply ship come down, um, the Terra Nova, uh, and Shackleton was invalided home. So he was pretty upset about that. He would have loved to have stayed in Antarctica, and I think that he felt um, slightly hard done by. Uh, certainly the, um, 
the accounts that you read would indicate that he felt a certain amount of, uh, wouldn't say anger perhaps, but um, disappointment was was focused, you know, on on Scott as the expedition leader. Wow. I think Scott really didn't have a choice. I think that he did the right thing by sending this um, this ailing member of the expedition away back to civilization back to New Zealand to be to be cared for I think that's um you know he I, I don't think that he behaved unfairly but that is sort of like the the genesis of this whole Shackleton versus Scott um, myth really what what happened next is interesting I think because Shackleton was desperate to get back to Antarctica. He, um, pretty soon after that, he started uh, entertaining the idea of leading his own expedition, uh, his own assault on the pole, and started to uh, fundraise in Great Britain. And that uh, was unfortunate because it was sort of at the same time when Scott was um, starting to think that he might like to go back again. And right. obviously there was this incredible rivalry um, around funding. You know, this is this is big business. You know, you 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 can't really have two people, do, you know, going after the same thing. And obviously, two very ambitious men, both of them hell bent on on getting to the pole. They're going to step on each other's toes. Shackleton did go down with the Nimrod. Um, he uh, made another attempt on the pole. He got to 88 degrees south, so a lot closer to the pole, and made a very wise decision to turn back. Uh, their provisions were not going to last them long enough to make up those two you know, degrees of, of um, latitude. And... Um, he came back to Great Britain. He was fated as a as a polar hero, um, and uh, and obviously Scott went back um, to uh, to to do uh, to make his own attempt uh, with Terra Nova. Wow! Later, did get to the pole, but uh, unfortunately, a month uh, after Roald Amundsen had been there, so. Oh. Um, and then, and then, tragically died on the way back. So I think the the, the Scott Shackleton um, rivalry, uh, there's there's certainly a, a lot to it. Um, but whether or not it was as pronounced as you know some commentators, some polar scholars would have us believe, is um, is you know, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating, and. I think that's that rivalries and the adventures and things going wrong and the tragedies are all the things that feed into making these stories so incredible. In your opinion, in writing about these and in researching them, what is it that makes these stories so engaging and so poignant? Well, I think I, I touched on it before when I was talking about the personalities. They're all mm. larger than life. And I think that this... This era of uh, polar ex early polar exploration is is so character driven. You know these these. I mean, I I I do struggle. You know, with the idea of calling them characters. I mean, in, in my work, they're certainly they're certainly characters, um, but they're also characters in the other sense of the word. You know, they're they're um, driven. You know, ambitious. Um, uh, but they're also uh, uh, totally focused on 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 a on a particular goal, focused on making their mark in history. Uh, they have to be excellent leaders. They have to inspire people. They have to be public figures. You know, we expect a lot of of these guys. Not only do they have to excel on the ice, but they have to come home and talk about it. They have to be able to write about it in a compelling way. They have to be able to to talk about it. They've got they go on lecture, um, so, you know, lecture tours. Uh, to tell people about it, so they they have to they have to be um, so many things to so many different people. I think that's that's one of the things about um, Shackleton was he was uh, fantastic 
at rallying support, not only uh, among you know with with his with his crew, with his men, but also the the in the fundraising stakes. You know, he was just a a brilliant, uh, convivial character who was able to um, inspire people and and maybe. Um, you know that's that's one of the things that that comes across again and again when you when you're reading some of his speeches and uh, some of the the accounts of people who had dealings with him was just this incredible energy and uh, infectious enthusiasm. I think that's that's um, you know certainly in the case of uh, of Shackleton Scott obviously was a far more reserved character. He was far more establishment. Uh, definitely a man that was motivated by um, uh, quest for knowledge. He was he was dedicated to science and and the uh, scientific investigation and inquiry down on the ice. That's one thing that Shackleton, you know, he sort of um, he was interested in science as a way of um, conf- you know acquiring. Uh, respectability for the expeditions, but it wasn't as critically important to somebody, to to him as it was for somebody like, like Scott. Again, Amundsen was was an interesting character uh, in himself too, because he was uh, prepared to lie um, wow. publicly, but also lie to his men about what his intention was. You know, they were they were his crew were told that they were heading uh, to the um, to the North Pole, and instead they were heading south. So uh, he he was also quite single-minded, very interested in acquiring uh, polar prizes, you know, in the sense of um, world firsts, uh, distinguishing himself through achievement, you know, this, these, these superhuman feats of, of um, endurance. So he's an interesting character as well. And, and the men that were attracted to these expeditions, you know, these were hard guys. They were the sort of men that, that weren't necessarily interested in putting their feet up at the end of the day and reading the newspaper and having a nice hot meal. They actually wanted adventure. Yeah. And it was all, they were all men. There were no women involved. So that sort of is an interesting environment too. You know, you see, you see men uh, behaving bravely generally but there are instances where men didn't um, necessarily distinguish themselves and those those episodes are quite interesting and revealing for for a number of reasons you know the, the character flaws and I think that the polar environments because they're so uh, not only the the environmental conditions are so hostile but also they they sort of sit these are zones that that are otherworldly. They sit outside of time. They sit outside of civilization. And so you get people behaving in a particular way, which is so interesting. The wow. psychology of people operating within these polar environments is you, you don't you just don't see it in, in other regions of, of, of the world. I think it's probably a bit like um, you know, the the people heading out into you know, into space, you know, yeah. space exploration probably will, will attract the same sorts of people. Wow. No, it's, it's fascinating. And, and something that you mentioned um, earlier was uh, in your research for, for these books, um, going to the archives and looking at all their sources. But something you also do is actually go and experience these things for yourself. And you actually <laughs> undertook a, a Southern Ocean crossing to, to get a sense yeah. of that emptiness and, and vastness that Shackleton would have experienced. What was that like? Well, I <clears throat> I left from New Zealand, um, uh, bottom of New Zealand, a place called Bluff, and I uh, hopped on a on a on a on a boat, not a very big boat, and um, went down to uh, went down to the Ross Sea region, um, stopping, stopping off at Macquarie Island, uh, one of the sub-Antarctic islands uh, belonging to Australia, and um, encountered a rather, uh, well, I'll say bad uh, storm at sea. Um, it lasted about five days, wow. and um, it, it was it was pretty terrifying to be in, um, you know, really big seas. 
and uh, just how small you are, <laughs> you yeah. know, when yeah. uh, you're being tossed around. You really are. Um, you really are. You know, pretty powerless against the elements down there. the The Southern Ocean is a pretty, um, a pretty crazy place. You know, huge waves. You get these incredibly strong winds. You know, the 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 winds that whip around the the bottom of the planet. You know, and the um, screaming sixties. You know, the you hear about the roaring forties and the um, well, the screaming sixties are, are pretty wild as well. Um, the winds that that tear around the planet in a westerly direction, um, whipping up the ocean. You know, it's 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 uh, terrific to experience. It's not something that I would necessarily want to do every year, but um, it was certainly very useful to get a firsthand experience of that um, and talk to the people that that are regularly down in those yeah. high latitudes in the in the ships um, that are resupplying um, their bases down there on the Ross Sea. So that was that was great. The the you know, it's a long way away. It takes a long time to get down there. And once you're down there, uh, it also takes a long time to get out. So if, if bad stuff happens down there, you really are on your own. Wow. And um, that's something that, you know, hasn't really changed in, um, in modern days. You know, there are, you know, there aren't any commercial flights heading down to Antarctica. I'm sure it will happen at some point, but, um, you know, certainly getting down to that Ross Sea area, you know, it's, it's by boat. Um, the Ross Sea is uh, huge. Uh, everything is, is in Antarctica is, you know, large scale. You know, the mountains are massive and uh, an area that looks as though it would take a day's sailing to, you know, to, to get from A to B, it's, you know, it's more like three days. And um, you really get a sense of just how unpredictable the weather is. Things change incredibly quickly. You might be on shore um, doing a... Um, you know, uh, visiting a, a heroic, um, a historic hut, and then you you get radioed and told that the ship will, you know, it's not the ship's not going to be able to stay there. Wow! You have to get get back to the ship. You know, visibility is an issue. Ice is an issue. Everything seems to be an issue. You know, you're you're never you're never warm enough. Even wow. with modern clothing, you're never warm enough. The wind cuts right through you. So it's it's great to be able to experience those things and um, be able to return to a warm cabin where you can you know you can have a hot drink. Yes. You know that you're yes. pretty much safe for the night. You'll be able to sleep, um, and that's something that's a luxury that obviously these early explorers. You know, they had incredibly basic uh, outfits in terms of the technical gear as, um, you know, the foodstuffs that they had were very rudimentary, didn't necessarily supply the the nutritional needs that they needed to to, to uh, make these sledging journeys. Um, even their, you know, the tents, um, the footwear, everything was, was pretty inadequate. So it really gives you a fresh appreciation of just what they achieved, what they were able to achieve. You know, the when you look at um, the the distances that they traveled, hauling sledges, uh, Captain Scott, for example, um, on his polar journey, 150 days they were hauling, hauling their sledges. Um, and then later with the Ross Sea Party, the men that were part of Shackleton's uh, contingent on the other side of the continent. They they had 199 days sledging out in the elements, wow. braving the blizzards. You know, in, and incredibly cold. You know, minus 40. It's just it's you 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 cannot conceive of it. It's just it's beyond our experience. So, being able, you know, how do you convey that in words? How do you how do you uh, give a sense of that in your writing? This is something that really um, I was really eager to to understand because it's almost indescribable yeah absolutely no it's it's incredible and those first-hand experiences really kind of make everything a lot more visceral when you're when you're writing yeah. it is did it play a large role in the way that you wrote afterwards 
Um, well, I certainly had a long time on the ship, so it was very productive time. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the crossing, the crossings, you, you end up sitting around a lot, you know, waiting for the weather to clear, waiting to, you know. Um, so, you know, just to be completely flippant about it, you know, it was a very productive time. In terms of the, um, you know, my ability to convey all of these conditions, um, the experience of being out there um, in, in my writing, it definitely helped. Um, I think it, I think so much of it happens in your head. I think that the, the Antarctica is really a landscape of the mind. I think mm. this is one of the things that you encounter time and again when you're reading the diaries of the men is that when there is no horizon, you're surrounded by white. Um, there's no, there are no landscape features. You're walking through this landscape where you could be, you know, inside a ping pong ball. You know, there's absolutely no definition. Everything goes inside here. You know, you're you're very much in your own head. So it's almost like you disappear into your own thoughts, and that can be quite mesmerizing. I think so. You know, there's only so much of that you you need to experience in order to kind of conceive of what what was happening. Wow, that is. Do you understand what I'm what I'm trying to say? Yeah, it's not too too esoteric. No, it's it's incredible and it's fascinating. Like you mentioned before, the psycho the psychological elements of the expeditions as well as the the physical elements. It's just it is incredible. It is fascinating. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Present History Podcast. But this was only half of our conversation. So make sure you check back next week to hear more about Joanna's writing technique, the way that she blends fact with fiction, and more of the incredible story of Ernest Shackleton. You definitely don't want to miss that. So check back next week. In the meantime, make sure to follow us on all social medias to keep up to date with all that we do. And if you want to find out more about Joanna Grahovich and her book, all the links will be in the episode description as well. So never fear. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Present History Podcast.